April 8th. Uh, it's the Thursday after Easter. Last week we were talking about Monday Thursday and Jesus washing the feet of the disciples at the Last Supper. A lot has transpired in the biblical uh, account of Jesus and his now resurrection. Um, I'm going to share with you just some, some I don't want to say casually prepared, but uh, thoughtfully prepared and prayed over things that I'm working on towards Sunday sermon. I thought Sunday I was going to be preaching about Doubting Thomas and Jesus' encounter with Thomas one week after Resurrection Sunday. But uh, I don't know, my heart has been drawn to uh, one of my other favorite stories of the resurrection accounts, and this is the road to Emmaus, found in Luke chapter 24. Just a couple of announcements before we get on with today's devotional. Uh, we are in the prime sign-up se um, season. It's the prime time to be signing up for the trip to Israel. Uh, the trip is scheduled for next February 18th. But in the next 60 days, it's really the prime time to be signing up and making those commitments um, to, to, to do that. So be thinking about whether you want to travel with Linda and I and others from the church. Uh, we're going to fly into Jordan. We're going to see Petra. We're going to see the place where Moses um, was able to see the promised land. And then we're going to see many of the highlights of Israel and the life of Jesus in the first century. And we're going to be challenged and reminded of the the vibrancy, the vitality of our faith and the roots of our faith, what it means to us today, what it means to us tomorrow. I'd love to have you join us. We had excellent attendance on Sunday. Thank you for those that were coming out. Many of you came out for the first time. Uh, it's great to have people gathered together in person. We also had uh, good numbers on the streaming audience, but uh, we pray as a staff that we might be better and better able to minister, to connect, and to encourage your faith and trust in God. Um, and I think those are probably the, the biggest highlights that we have going into this, this Sunday. Uh, we're back to a normal schedule this Sunday. Uh, we have in-person worship at 10 o'clock. We try to encourage people to be generally situated by 945. We typically have a little devotional period uh, before we start the uh, broadcast. It's personal. It's for the in-person people. Uh, it's unique. It's special. And it prepares us, I think, for the delivery of God's Word that comes in the primary service at 10 o'clock. So we welcome you. We enjoy um, and uh, encourage you to come on out and uh, look into the Israel trip and see if that's something that you might be wanting to, uh, to do. Heavenly Father, help us today as we reflect upon your word. We reflect upon the resurrection. We reflect upon the context that uh, we read about in the Bible. We then look to apply it to our lives today and anticipate what it means to us tomorrow. Past, present, and future. That is the Christian faith that carries us, that sustains us, and that gives us hope. In all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'll summarize some of the story of, um, of Luke 24. Uh, it's called The Road to Emmaus. It's a famous story. Many of you will probably know it or recognize it by hand. Um, we're told uh, by Dr. Luke that two people, uh, some think it was two men, I think it might have been a man and a woman, two people were heading from Jerusalem back to Emmaus. The Bible tells us it was a a little village six miles away. I'm picturing a village something like Bethany. It was two miles on the other side of Jerusalem. Emmaus is, is six miles on the other side, going a little bit north and a little bit uh, west. They were dejected. They were downtrodden. They were hopeless. Uh, they were walking, and Jesus joins them. The resurrected Jesus, the risen Jesus, the glorified Jesus, the new Jesus. Jesus, the resurrected body that we've talked about a little bit this, this Easter season. And they did not recognize him. He asked them a question like Jesus often does, as Jesus asks us questions in our life. He said to them, what are you thinking about? What are you talking about? What is going on? They couldn't believe that Jesus was unaware and uh, un, uh, obtuse, actually, to the, to the whole thing. So they began to tell him. And in verse uh, 13 or verse 19, I'm sorry, they said, well, Jesus of Nazareth, 
the Jewish rulers, the Roman rulers, uh, had him crucified. And for us, we thought he was the hope for tomorrow. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he would help overthrow the oppression of Rome. We thought, we thought, we thought, we thought, we thought, and all the expectations that these two people, and I believe along with the other disciples, the other group of those that followed Jesus. Now, just a side comment, we know that there was 12 disciples that were the closest to Jesus, but we know that within that, there or beyond that, there was even uh, those that were uh, travelers and, and those that were close. And probably as many as 100 people, 120 people, were amongst the followers of Jesus that were particularly close, maybe even gathered in the upper room or in their meeting rooms during this, this particular week from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday to beyond. And uh, it's fun to imagine who all was in that group. These two people were part of that group. Uh, they weren't one of the 12, but they were obviously intimate, obviously engaged, and obviously close. And they said, we thought he was going to redeem Israel. Some of our women amazed us this morning when they went to the tomb and they came back and they said the tomb was empty. We were amazed. We were in disbelief, even at this news. They came and told us that they had seen angels. Some of our companions went to the tomb and found it as the women said, but they, presuming John and Peter, did not see Jesus themselves. So Jesus says to them, still unrecognized by them, how foolish you are, how slow to believe. Don't you remember what the prophets have said? Don't you remember what the written word of God is? Don't you remember the strength of your faith rooted in scripture? Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things to enter his glory? Again, the disciples and those around Jesus had little connection. They weren't able to see when Jesus said, uh, the temple will be destroyed and raised up in three days. They, they didn't see the, the need for the death of Jesus so that there might be a resurrection that, that conquers death, that conquers sin, and opens the door for all people. That, was a, uh, that wasn't clearly relevant or understandable. Uh, isn't that the way life is? Just like these two travelers had trouble seeing and recognizing Jesus, we have trouble seeing and recognizing Jesus. And even though Jesus is with us, Jesus is engaged with us, and Jesus cares for us. We often do not see him present with us. But there's something right now, I would say it's the inkling of the Holy Spirit, that prompts us on and prompts us to ask questions and helps us to have our eyes open that we would then begin to understand those things that we have learned or those things that we have read or the context or the memory of those things that have been uh, presented to us. In this case, Jesus tried to prompt them in, in thinking about their spiritual and religious heritage, their learning of the Old Testament scriptures. They were pointing to him as Messiah. Not a Messiah that was political, but a Messiah that was spiritual. Uh, a Messiah that was life-giving to our very soul and our very spirit. I think that's important because when we look at these two travelers, they clearly lost hope. They went from having high hope to having no hope. They didn't understand scripture. They trusted and uh, uh, believed in Jesus, but then they were disappointed. And they were probably on the edge of being cynical. Have you ever been on the edge of being cynical? Uh, if I had preached the story on Doubting Thomas, he was clearly a cynical, uh, feeling betrayed, feeling disappointed, feeling like all that he invested himself with enthusiasm and now turn south and turn sour. Have you ever felt that way? Like these travelers, I think we can relate to them because they had lost their hope. Even though the tomb was empty, their ability to believe, to reignite that hope the, uh, w w was, was being held back, understandably. Hence, they wanted to see and to touch and to feel, just like Thomas. They wanted to see and to feel and to touch Jesus themselves. They'd lost their hope. They also lost their joy. They lost their gladness to life. When things are going good and we feel like we're, we're connected to God and to others, we have a certain gladness or joy that comes from the inside out. And in this case, the travelers that we are looking at, considering and reflecting upon, had lost their gladness. 
They also had lost their desire to do or to be anything more. We need desire to motivate us. We need desire to, to carry us forward. We need desire to, to give us a vision for which we are looking forward to. And I think one of the consequences of being hopeless is that we also lose our desire to be and to do what needs to be done. Hence, we become self-absorbed and self-turned. Now, what happened? What did Jesus say and what did Jesus do? He explained to them the scriptures. He explained to them the relevance of Moses and the prophets, and uh, it, it came alive. We were told in Luke 24 that this was a seven-mile journey. Well, if you walk two miles an hour uh, up and down the hills and uh, for a sustained time, this is probably a three- to four-hour walk. If you walk three miles an hour, it's a two-and-a-half-hour walk. Regardless, it tells us that Jesus and these travelers had some time together. And Jesus began to share with them as they began to have their mind and their hearts. Now, we as humans are body, mind, and spirit. All three dimensions have to be ministered to and to be touched for us to be engaged and ready to go forward in faith. Jesus explained to them what was said in the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. They urged him strongly, don't keep going, stay with us, have dinner with us, have some food with us. It's not a lot, but you can have what we have and we can share and we can keep talking. When he was at the table, Jesus took the bread, get this, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he began to give it to them. At that moment, their eyes were open and they saw that it was Jesus, their Lord. Friends, I can't help but notice the, the reference, it seems to me, at the feeding of the 5,000. What did Jesus do with the, with the five loaves and three fishes? He took their gift. He gave thanks for it. He broke it and consecrated it and thanked God for it and began to distribute it. Whenever we are in need of nourishment, Jesus is there to take the bread of life to break it, to give thanks for it, to consecrate it, and to allow it, to help it, to enable it to meet and nourish our needs, both in spirit and body. As their eyes were nourished by the presence of Jesus, their eyes were open, and they saw that, indeed, God was with them. Jesus was with them. Each of us along our life's journey sometimes go through life knowing that Jesus is with us or not knowing that he is with us, not seeing him. But then all of a sudden something happens. I think the Holy Spirit pricks our, our, our sensibilities and we see who it is that is with us. In this case, they saw it was Jesus. They got up and uh, returned because Jesus soon disappeared. He counted on them. He relied on them to go back and tell the others what had happened. Friends, Jesus nourishes us, touches us, then asks us, expects us to go and tell others. We see before the ascension that, that Jesus says, go and be my witnesses to all the world. Go and tell what you've seen and what you've experienced. On Sunday, or on last Friday, a good Friday, we said, were you there when they nailed him to the cross? And then on Sunday, we sang, because he lives. And part of that is because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, we know without doubt that he is with us. How do we know this? Ultimately, we know it in our heart. Our life has been touched. Our life has been changed. Our life has been encouraged. So even though there's things like facts and there's things like reason, it's really an experiential touch by God that opens the soul of our heart, the eyes of our heart, that we would know Jesus in the real person. Very quickly, Jesus showed them why he had to die and that indeed he was resurrected and made new, that he opens the door for all people to experience the resurrected life, not the life of defeat, not the life of death, not the life that is terminal in the end, but a life that is filled with life and encouragement and possibility. Jesus led them back to the written word of God where they were rooted and re-anchored. 
And on Sunday, we're going to talk about rooting our lives in the Word of God, that we might then find strength and solace for today, hope for tomorrow, and inspiration to carry us forward, that gives us the desire to move up and move out. Jesus leads them to the table. And it's always at the table of God, the table of Christ, the communion table, the sacramental table, that we encounter Jesus in a very special and sacramental way. Not just in person, but in spirit. Body, mind, and spirit. We're reminded of what he did. We're reminded that he's with us today and continues to intercede for us. And while the eyes of the world were on Jesus, his eyes continue to be among us. And then we are reminded of the promise that Jesus has given his disciples and he's given us, that he will come again and make all things right. But in the meantime, we have the seed of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we can develop, that we can cultivate, and that we can already begin to experience the kingdom of heaven within us. But then the final word, Jesus says, go and share and tell others that they too might be encouraged and find hope, and that I am alive, I am resurrected, and I offer life to all things. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will not die in spirit or will live forever in a world that is a better place, a world of hope and encouragement and promise. And that's what I leave with you today. Be refreshed, be renewed, be revived, and be resurrected in your life today and tomorrow. Dear God, this is just a brief devotional. It's giving rise and giving structure to the sermon to come. But I pray that each person here might be encouraged, even in the reminding of ourselves, that Jesus is alive, that Jesus reaches out to the those with no names. Jesus reaches out to all people. And as we begin to listen, our eyes are open and we see Jesus, the resurrected Messiah the Son of God, the Son of Man, God incarnate for you and for me. In Jesus' name I pray that you would be blessed and that you would have the best day of the rest of your life right now, today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. I hope you have a good day. And uh, we'll talk to you on Sunday, if not before. We look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye.